<laughs> you get your PowerPoint off and up, and then you can be a human being, right? It's crazy. Hi, all. Let me look at you. Well, I know Laura, and I know Julie, oh, and I, Emma. Emma, I'm sorry, Emma. And, that's right. <laughs> and, and I know Julie, and I know Rachel. Rachel. But I don't know the rest of you, do I? Uh, that would be great, but I won't remember. That's, that's the problem. <laughs> you'll go around. I hate that part. You go around and you'll say, you know, my name is this and this and this and that, and then it'll be totally all gone. So maybe in the conversation that we have, I mean, this is not, I'm not going to talk at you for an hour, I hope. <laughs> um, so maybe in the conversation that we have, we can, um, we, and, and I'm sorry, my clicker is not working, so uh, you're going to see my very messy desktop and the whole thing. Um, but anyway, let me just start in. So I think I'm here for two reasons. Um, Julie can, can say better, but it's a confluence of things. So let me tell you what they are, and then let me tell you what we're, I think we're going to talk about. Um, and then I really all really want to make it a conversation and not a presentation. Uh, but first, let me kind of set it up. So my name is Eileen Lande, and I've been teaching at Brown since 1993. Um, and I, and I, my, my appointment is in the education department. And um, from 1993 until 2006, I was 1993, you guys were just about born then, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and my appointment was Director of English Education. You know, we, uh, there's a, a Master of Arts in Teaching program, an MIT, MAT, MAT, and there's also a, a fifth year program and, uh, in, in education, both elementary and secondary, preparing teachers. So my job was to do the, uh, the director part, but also the English part. So I'm an English teacher at heart. I, I um, have taught in high school and elementary school and so forth. Um, so, that, so that a lot of what I'm going to talk about is um, what goes on in the education world. Um, in another part of my story, I am a member of a family where uh, we have relatively recently a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. And that diagnosis was like, unfortunately, in a way, the way diagnoses can do, a giant aha for us because all of a sudden, all the quirkiness that we saw that was kind of threading through the whole fam some members of the whole family came to make sense. Um, now, the, there, uh, for, for reasons of confidentiality, I'll talk about that part a little bit in generalization. But suffice it to say that I've had a lot of experience now with both an officially diagnosed Asperger's person and the whole rest of the crazy family that now I kind of, and you have to be, a, you know, I'm very aware that you have to be cautious about that. Um, but I will tell you that it's been a revelation for, for me personally. So those two things come together, my teaching life and my, my personal life, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but I'll go back to the teaching life for now. Um, so as, um, as someone whose main job was to prepare secondary English teachers, which is what I did for uh, 15 years, I spent a lot of time sitting in the back of high school classrooms here in Providence. And, uh, and I'd been an English teacher, as I said. And so let me get back to my PowerPoint for a second. Okay, so, so I spent a whole lot of time sitting in the back of classrooms, and this is what I saw. <laughs> no, not quite, not quite. 
but almost. <coughs> Look familiar to anybody? <laughs> and it, it, was, and it, it was really tough uh, for me to sit there for a long time. And it wasn't that my students weren't great uh, or that w they weren't trying really hard. It's just that that's what school looked like a lot. Um, you know, rather recently, in fact, I can, I can send you the link to this. Um, uh, uh, Grant Wiggins, who's an education person, ha put on his uh, blog um, another, a blog of an English teacher who, um, who shadowed a kid for two days, a high school kid. And was, it was like a, revolu a revelation. So for those of you who have an, any interest at all in this world of the art and science and how that comes together in the school world, one thing that I might suggest to you is to do exactly that. You, you, I know that you all live through it and that you have memories of it. But to actually, with a per certain kind of distance and perspective, to actually follow a kid around is a pretty astonishing thing to do. Um, and, I, and I found it very disturbing that, that a lot of what I found was people half awake or a quarter of awake. And so somebody came to me with um, a little project and said, uh, you know, if you could make some differences in schools, what would you do? And I just kind of blurted out, I was sitting in my office, I was just across from Barris Hall, and I said, I would get kids out of their seats and on their feet. And I didn't know where that came from. Well, I mean, I did. And so she said, well, why don't you, you know, why don't you try, try some of that out? And so in 19, this was 1998, over the course of that year, no, yeah, I started something called the Arts Literacy Project. And the idea was not to have kids spending all their time in their seats doing academic work, do, doing work with print text, but to incorporate other mediums, um, to incorporate other modalities, and to get kids thinking more artfully. Sometimes when I work with teachers, I say to them, when in your, and this is another question you might ask yourself, when in your education were you most academically awake? And um, that's not a question teachers hear very often, but it's a very, um, it's one that asks, asks them to think a lot. And I always get very interesting answers, and the answers are very often when they're doing something that involves the arts, is artful, <coughs> involves some physical activity, um, involves some kin something kinesthetic, um, and they remember that. But they also know that, that this is the kind of thing that they see a whole lot more than they wish they did. So anyway, with this wonderful problem in mind, or not so wonderful, um, I started this, and, and a little bit of resources, and some students just like you. Um, I started something called the Arts Literacy Project here at Brown, and I also started a class called um, Literacy Community in the Arts. And, um, and we also, uh, during the summer, there's a, a, a summer program here ca called Brown Summer High School, which is really... Um, really a boot camp for uh, people who are preparing to be teachers. And we bring about, two, well, I don't know how many this year, about 200 kids from Providence and actually run a high school for, the, for a month uh, with a lot of support. And so we did, we introduced some classes that involved the arts at Brown Summer High School. And, the, uh, and we actually brought practicing artists and teachers together around a central text and we tried out using a lot of these arts activities. So anyway, over the course, now this enough of my story, but so over the course of the years when we did this work, we, we found that we were developing a method or a design or a structure um, that seemed to work to, to get that kid's head up 
off her desk. And the structure looked like this. And, and it actually, we sort of developed it. It, it emerged from, whoop, just went away. Here we go. I don't know why. Um, and the, uh, oh, I do know why. Uh, and so this structure just emerged when we were trying out a lot of things. I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. We knew we wanted to get the kids out of their seats and on their feet. And uh, we knew that we wanted to use a challenging text, and we knew that we wanted to introduce the arts. And so suddenly we figured out that there was something that we were all doing in common. This was over the course of the summer and over the course of my Brown class. And so we created a model of this thing that we thought we were doing called the performance cycle. And it's really held up uh, for us over the years. And so, in fact, it is exactly what, what we now do. And what I'm going to do in the next little bit of time, first of all, I'm going to give you a handout and uh, that describes the performance cycle. And you can obviously take it away. And then I'm going to sort of run you through what it looks like in, in classrooms. Um, and I'm going to give you a sort of a guided tour of the performance cycle. Um, and then I'll kind of come back and talk about my family and what I'm seeing with some of the people in my family who are in school. So. Here's, here's this. I'm enough of a teacher to know that when I hand out a piece of paper, what happens is you start to read it, which makes perfect sense. So take a couple of minutes and do that. There you go. So just kind of skim it. What? I'm sorry? You're not offering it again this spring, right? Oh, I don't know what Laura's doing. Uh, so I should, that, that's a good question, but we'll, we'll let them look it over and then I'll, I'll talk about that. And by the way, do jump in with questions. I, I appreciate that, Emma. That's a great question because some people might like to take it. Well, I took it last semester. Yeah. Good. So just skim it because I'm going to actually take you through it with some photographs. Are there any extras? There's one. Okay. So Emma asked the question. So I taught the, the class that was connected to this from 1998 until 2006, and then the person who, and, and I'm now only teaching one class during the summer, and it's not this, but uh, there's a wonderful person in the education department whose name is Laura Snyder, who, very, who, who took over for me, and she really does teach this class still, uh, and it's um, Education 1690, call, and I think it's called Literacy Community in the Arts. Um, and so she, it's not only this work, but but she's, she usually uses this as her centerpiece, and Emma took it last year, right? Um, OK, so let me, so let me um, say one more thing, and then I'm going to walk you through the performance cycle with, with uh, pictures. Um, one of the, on top of the fact that kids had their heads down there on, on their desks, another thing that we discovered, I was downtown, and I remember just where I was in Central High School observing a, a student teacher and she was trying to get her kids to have a discussion. It was a great big class. And so somebody kept raising their hand like this. They had, a per they had something they had to say. And so she called on him and she said, I don't, and the person spoke up and said, I don't agree with that kid over there. And was, so the, the student was referring to a comment that had been made by another student in the class. This was March. And I realized that this class of 30 kids had been together all since the fall, and none of them knew each other's names. And so a discussion was, was pretty rare, but even when my students started it, there was that kid over there and that kid over there. 
So the very first thing we figured when we started doing this work was that really to have a good learning environment, you needed a community. And so the very first thing that we started working on was community building. And well, well let me, uh, maybe I'll go over this first before I jump into community building. So this, these are the key ideas in uh, the performance cycle. Students see the purpose for the work they're doing, and that's really important. I'll come back to that when I talk about Asperger's. Students and teachers collaborate in a community. That's my community point. Whoops. I know, I have to change the thing that says, um, but maybe I'll just keep my finger on it. Students see language and the arts as codes or modalities. Students build on core text to produce original work in multiple codes or modalities. So that, those are sort of the core ideas. And so community. I'm going to show you some pictures. Oh, and the pictures I'm going to show you, since 2006, I've been doing a lot of work with both teachers and kids around the country. Um, and it's been very interesting. Obviously, you can't introduce something like the performance cycle in a classroom until the teachers themselves have figured out that they need it and that they, that, or that it's useful to them. So some of what I'm going to show you would be groups of teachers doing this work, and some of it will be students doing this work. In this particular case, this was Louisville, Kentucky, and it was last week, and it was a group of teachers, and this was what community building looked like. So the first thing we did, among many other things, is put them in groups and had them have little conversations with each other. What did you have to do to get here today? That kind of question. Um, the second thing, the other thing we did um, was to do a lot of sort of theater games and actually looked like the kind of thing that you guys were doing when I came in here at 2.30. Um, a lot of moving around. Anybody, I don't suppose you can recognize what room that is. That's actually a, a room in Wilson Hall, Wilson 302. Um, and it is Brown Summer High School. And those are a group of high school kids. And what you may not be able to see is that up in the air are a bunch of balloons. So it was this simple thing of keep the balloons up in the air. Um, and look at their faces. A lot of what I look for a lot when I'm working with kids in high school is, is anybody smiling? Is anybody laughing? Is anybody moving? Um, so this is the very beginning of community building. Here's another example of more community building with gestures. And this was actually in St. Paul, Minnesota, high school kids. Um, and adults together at C Central High School. Anybody from Minnesota? Um, yeah, you are? <laughs> yeah. No St. Paul? Yeah. No. I'm from Minneapolis. Yeah, right. Oh, from, well, I know. Minneapolis <laughs> is not far. So uh, this is Central High School in St. Paul, and I work with a brilliant teacher there whose name is Jan Mandel. And I know some, actually a few people from high schools in Minneapolis are doing some stuff, too. Um, so this is gestures, and this was, is something called the human atom in which it's another theater game, that's all. It's just one of these many, many theater games, you know, like freeze. This was, I think what this was, was a moment where we were teaching them to freeze. And part of that is that teachers get very scared about classroom management and they say, I can't get my kids out of my seats, they'll kill each other. So you have to really do a lot of teach them management skills. And one of them, the greatest one, is to teach them to teach freeze. Simple. Okay, so this was freeze. Um, and then there were, you know, another series of theater uh, activities or games. I can't remember exactly what was happening here, but, um, but it was pretty physical and a lot of movement involved. Um, I think that's also St. Paul. And then, <laughs> this is, <laughs> oh. this is um, a group of middle school kids. Um, who, was work, who were working with my student, Dan DeSales, in um, Calcutt Middle School in Central Falls. And he's of the much more active theater, sort of theater game problems, you know, like how do you get somebody up over, over a, that, this was, how do you wrap everybody up in tape and then, I can't remember, get unwrapped somehow or something. Now, again, this is, 
teachers get terrified when they see these kinds of things. But Dan can manage all of this and he's brilliant at it. And again, look at the faces and look at the smiles. So that's what community building looks like. And it, so it looks like working together physically and also, if you remember the very first thing that I showed you, starting to talk to each other, actually tell each other your story. Who are you? Why are you, you know, who, why are you in this room? Well, if, you know, if for high school kids, they're in this room because they have to be in this room. But, you know, how did you get here? What, what are you interested in? What do you care about? And so the whole idea is really to build community. Now, I, I will say before I go on that this is not like a formula that you go step by step. But it's all sort of recursive. So this wasn't the first day that Dan saw these kids at all. Um, we keep coming back to, just like obviously you did today, because this is not the first day you were together. A lot of movement, a lot of physicality, a lot of close communication. So that's what community building looks like. And if you read what it says here, it says, building community involves a shared purpose. Sportive, supportive relationships and a repertoire of routines and activities. And um, the shared purpose uh, comes, a little, comes to you a little later um, because every one of these activities has some kind of quote unquote performance at the end. Um, so very often we find that this kind of thing really begins to work only after the kids have gone through the cycle the first time and ended up doing some something together, something for a public audience. And, um, and then suddenly they are a community, and suddenly they say, can we go through all of that all over again? And then sudden, oh, often the semester is over. But it doesn't really have to be like that. So that's building community. And, and then we do the next part of it that we've discovered is something called entering text. I think I'm. I want to speed up a little bit because I don't really, I want to make this a part of a conversation, not just me talking. But um, the whole question of why are we doing this? I find very often in educational settings that teachers miss the why question. Why are we doing this? And so, and, and it works to tell kids, but it also work, works to kind of give them a puzzle or something to aim for and so forth. So the entering text is always the challenge, the puzzle, the question, the moving toward the, the process that they're doing. And so, so very often we use this whole idea. When you, when you were in high school, did anybody do things like essent, what they call essential questions or EQs? Yes. You, yours did? Anybody else? Yeah? Couple. So I find that in the best settings, you give kids a question to answer. Um, and the, the, um, the question that uh, I, I just got finished doing this work in Kentucky with a group of teachers who are then going to go off and teach it to their it's middle school kids. And the text is going to be the diary of Anne Frank. And so we introduced the idea of the essential question of, What's wor how do you bear witness? What does it worth bearing witness for? And the idea was that we introduced not you're going to read Anne Frank, not we want to tell you all about the Holocaust, but in your own life, what's worth bearing witness for? And then introducing the idea that we're going to share with them a text in which that happened and, and then get them to try to figure out how that matters in their lives. So it's always trying to connect the text to their lives. Can I stop for a second? Anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah. Is this primarily for teaching like English classes? No. So that's a great question because I know that you're the arts and sciences. Now I'm an English teacher, so we did focus a lot on 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 print text, but. Uh, people have certainly used it for other things, especially the humanities. It becomes easier. Sciences also around environmental issues or, I mean, you know, the whole question of why do you have to learn physics? Um, well, you know, middle <laughs> you know, I mean, there, because they, sometimes theoretical physics is one thing, but there are, you know, real world issues that are addressed by that. And so, 
so the whole question of why do you have to learn anything seems to me to be uh, override the, um, the study of it. Um, and you just have to figure out what would make sense to kids in terms of talking to them about why do this. Um, and that actually brings me back to my, my child with Asperger's who is in a situation where there's not a whole lot of exactly what we're talking about going on. And so, for example, he had to write a paper on um, global, global warming. No, it wasn't global warming. It was something like that. And, and what the teacher actually paid attention to was how far was, were his words away from the margins? You know, and what, did he have a topic sentence? And not, why does it matter that in fourth grade we're studying global warming? And so I think that the whole question of trying to, to tr get inside the mind of a kid with, you know, a kid with Asperger's or any kid and figure out why are we teaching this? And to, to go in with them, trying to answer that question from the get-go and get them, draw them into helping you answer the question is exactly what we're aiming for. Uh, so it certainly can be done in science. Um, so this is an entering text. I, I have a couple of examples of entering text activities. And again, you're going to see teachers and you're going to see kids. Um, this was looking at pictures. Um, and this is a, actually a picture from a book that I'll bet a lot of you have seen called The People Could Fly. Uh, it's a, a folk tale, uh, African-American folk tale. And we were actually working on exactly that. But rather than giving them the story first, I know. Um, I just, um, just log out of Wi-Fi. Just what? If you log out of the Wi-Fi, if you turn off your Wi-Fi, it'll... Oh, it will do that? Yes. All right. But wait, to do that, I have to, OK. OK, I'll go here. Yeah. Oh, I do, you're right, but I can plug in. All right, so in fact, if you would do that for me, Emma, then I'll keep. Yep, keep doing here that. Here you go, keep it. doing it. Um, so, so anyway, the whole question of entering text, it can be anything. I think math is maybe a little bit hard, but those of and that's because the, I'm, I'm not as comfortable with the why question, answering the why questions in math, but I know that they're out there, and I know that those of you who are really into and very good at math can certainly do that. I can do it a little bit in geometry because that's concrete. Um, but I have seen good math teachers do th use this work, you know, and introduce introduce the why um, very effectively. Somebody was shaking their head. Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably my best teacher in high school was my math slash theater teacher. Uh, ah. Your combination. But he would approach all the problems with object based uh, thinking. How can we create? A system to encrypt messages, right. and from that you go on to arithmetic and how to make encryption systems and things like that. Or so I think that I think that's certainly the best way. The best way to teach anything for, to kids is to begin to sort of show them how they can connect with it, uh, and often, very often, physically, very often, kinesthetically. You know, there, was a, there are real world objects out there that matter. If, I mean, I've done it. We, I, I was talking to, to this particular child in my life, uh, and we were talking about how math could help you make a building straight. And the buildings needed to be straight if they were high. You know, that makes sense to them. So, so that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Yeah. So I, I don't mean to jump the gun at all, but um, I had a really close relationship with my uh, English teacher in school. Mm -hmm. um, and she was very creative. And I realized um, that after I graduated, there was a shift to standardized testing. You know, the teachers needed to then, you know, kind of rein in you know, their creative skills and start addressing you know, so standardized tests. School, you know, students like that. And I, I assume that this yeah. could really yeah. help with that as well. But I know she was struggling with yeah. integrating to create. Well, it. I mean, you raise the gigantic question, frankly, and you raise the question of what I'm doing a lot of pushing back against, 
because there is no, now, you know, I don't know if we're moving too far outside the field that you really, you guys really want to talk about, but education is heavily secondary and elementary, heavily designed around success in the kinds of testing that we're giving them. And I have serious questions about that um, because it feels to me like it takes, it, it, it's very easy to ex extract the purpose from it. Is the purpose to do well on a test? I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I think the purpose is to understand the world. And so I'm, I'm really, um, it's not that I'm totally opposed to standardized testing, but I think that we all have to think carefully about the extent to which it, it orchestrates what we do in schools. Um, and so for the child who was, who was doing the essay on um, global warming, whether or not he had a topic sentence struck me as less important than what in the world is go global warming and why should it matter to you? Uh, anyway, so that, that's, that's, my little, that's my little take on it. Anyway, so we um, move, a lot, move into print text in all kinds of interesting ways, but always with pub puzzles or, and always you'll see coll collaboratively, I better be careful, I'm gonna fall on this always collaboratively, always working, to, often working together. So this was a case in which uh, we took, I can't remember what text it was, but we had little strips of paper all over the floor. And the, uh, and the idea was for kids, again, they were moving first, to pick up those pieces of paper, read their sentence, figure out what it meant, find a partner, talk to them about it. What are these two strips of paper could they possibly have in common? I mean, doing that kind of puzzle puzzling. So what was happening right there is, again, those are t uh, old hands, so they were obviously teachers, and, and we had a group of teachers taking what they found on the floor and trying to order them in terms of how, what the, uh, I think it was chronological. What do you think happened first, second, third, and fourth? But also, you could do it poetically as well. And this is a place where you could certainly imagine using science, for example, to do this kind of thing. Um, so, you know, you're, it's a puzzle. All right, so next. Um, this is, comes from this weekend, actually, in Louisville. And what we did around the Anne Frank project is constructed something called a Cordell. Oh, I forgot to bring a copy of my book. Well, that wasn't smart, was it? Oh, well. I have the copy. Oh, you do? do you I'm not here with me, but I have the issue. So, so my, my colleague, Kurt Wooten, and I, who was my student, by the way, a long time at Brown, who was an MAT student, and now I call him my teacher because he is. Um, so we, he, he runs a school in Mexico, and um, one of the things that he learned to do in, in Mexico was something that apparently poets and writers do a lot in Mexico, which is to construct what they call string, string stories. And they, they go to marketplaces and write poems and put them up on on, uh, on, on string, and then people come along and I guess buy them. Um, and so, and they use this idea of a cordel or, uh, a lot. So we've been using it a lot. And so again, as a part of introducing, entering text, we made a cordel of um, the, histor the historical period in which Anne Frank wrote and excerpts from her diary and some can, and some poems that some other people wrote that connected the two things. And we introduced teachers to the idea of using a cordel. And this is just a simple, uh, it's not like we never go to books, but here, here what you can see is in entering text, kids are trying to, we posed a problem for them, and they were trying to sort out a couple of things. I can't remember at this point what it was, but you know, who's speaking here, and what do they really mean in this little place? And, I, and, the, and the text, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but again, that was at Brown somewhere, uh, and I don't remember where. Um, and then a lot of, here are those strips of paper lined up, um, and there are some teachers trying to uh, f put, put the pieces together, even you know, as a way of beginning to answer the essential question that we posed for them. I'm, I want to move along a little faster. And then, whoever, Emma, this is for you, actually. 
we also did a lot of movement stuff in entering text. Um, and so, and, and by the way, if you, make, get, if you can get teachers up and moving and do, you know, doing stuff with a smile on their face, then you know you've been pretty successful. And here we have uh, a movement activity um, that, th that is a way of entering text that's beginning to address a particular problem. All right. And here are a bunch of kids doing the same thing. We're back at Central High School in St. Paul now. And then finally, next, I'm a very big believer in the fact that I, I, I believe so much in extended text. In, um, and I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm really worried. Yeah, I see people at Brown reading books. But uh, I was on an airplane last week. and. Um, no more books. I mean, I know they're on, on your iPads and so forth. But anyway, it worries me. So, um, so I think there are two kinds of texts. One is extensive, which means reading widely. And that's what I do when I click around on the internet trying to sort out a bunch of different things and you know, follow where it leads me or try to do a little bit. And then ex intensive, which means, all right, so now I do take the diary of Anne Frank and read the whole thing from beginning to end. And they're very different. And part of my own research interest is what's the difference? And I know everybody under the sun is, is researching the whole question of what is the kind of reading that we're doing on the internet and how is that different from the kind of thing when, you know, when I put a book in your hands. And um, so, so here are the, the three things that, that I'm looking for in text. And that is and in any kind of problem. Asking students to focus, engage, and apply. And um, so how do we do that? We bunch, do a bunch of different activities. So this is one, one that's a lot of fun. Uh, this was Anne Frank. And what I did was take a diary excerpt and hand it out to teachers and then said, read it and talk back to the text. And write and talk back to the text by writing on it, by writing your thoughts, your questions, your concerns, your uh, what you think is strong, and then take a moment, stop, read what you wrote, read what you, the way you talk back, then pick up another implement and do a second reading through and do a second talk back to the text. So you'll see black and you'll see green. Anybody ever do anything like that in school? Yeah? You must have had a good teacher, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I did also. Okay. Um, with just books and more middle school than high school. Yeah. So anyway, this is the kind of thing that we've been doing. And, and this is the kind of thing that we're seeing. And here's a bunch of teachers. And so the, now, what I want to say is that the comprehending and the reading doesn't have to be entirely alone. They were doing a choral reading, which is an artful form of sort of presentation. And there are, for those of you who do theater work, there are a gazillion ways to do choral readings. Uh, so these are three teachers in Hartford working on choral readings. And a lot of discussion. Um, this is a, a, you know, once you do that read through, this was actually when, when someone did three trips to, through the text, then they talked to each other about what's your big takeaway? What's the question that you have? What's the idea that you want to deal with? And then I did, we did this very interesting thing. They had to finish a conversation with a question that they really wanted to talk to everybody about. And then we put the teachers in two circles, concentric circles, two concentric circles, and they had to eat, tell each other their questions and start to address them, and then move one step to the right and do the same thing all over again. So it was a way of holding a class discussion with two circles of people. So then after, now this is the, the key to what we think is important in Arts Lit, is not only that you, you read something that somebody else wrote, Walt Whitman, um, but you also, in response to that, you create something. Um, and so this is a storyteller. This, is a, this actually was Anne Frank, and this was a Holocaust, the child of a Holocaust survivor who was my friend and who was with us. And he told his family story. And then he gave people an opportunity to, 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 to address, using the essential question of bearing witness, 
to actually use a form that we developed and to begin to tell their own story. What would you bear witness to? Um, and so when I see, and so something similar is going on here, except it's in a storyboard. And, and one of the things that I'm always looking for when I teach with kids is always see the kind of intensity that you can see there, the kind of concentration, that, 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 that what they're doing matters. So it has to, I have to see that in a classroom in order to feel like what's happening is, is essential, to, matters to the kids and something that they'll take away. Now, we do a lot of art, a lot of visual art. Um, and this is something, um, of course, very often when you teach, kids will say, I can't draw. So you have to always have a response to that. So this is an activity that my colleague, Kurt, developed called Using Icons. Actually, I think he borrowed it from somebody else. But the idea is really not that you rep do something representational, but that you you actually create an icon that speaks to whatever it is, um, the, the story that you're trying to tell. And then after that, they, they take all the pieces, their own story, the Anne Frank story, their artwork, and they put it together in some kind of presentation. And it can be a presentation for their peers, a presentation for one other person, or it can be a great big full-blown presentation, but whatever it is, they have to really work on, on it, and they have to pr uh, practice it. I know that when all of you guys were in school, um, your teachers always had you revise things, right? And so usually, kids hate that. Um, so usually, when, as a teacher, when you ask kids to revise something, they copy it over nicely, or not so nicely. Um, but, but what we wanted people to do, on the other hand, those of you who are in the arts, know that if you're in a rehearsal, like a dance rehearsal, you're, you're revising all the time. And so if you can take revising and make it more into rehearsing, then I think that really interesting things are happening. So that's what was happening here. Um, and it's also what was happening here. Um, and these were middle school kids reading Othello. And you can, I don't have to say any more about, about it, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And actually, you'll see I show you this picture again because this was this, this was the performance. I mean, the they you know the performance was not a big full blown Othello for their parents, but it was actually just sharing ideas from the text with those <laughs> somehow the costumes, right? The um, and so then finally we have performance, and again, I'll show you, because this was the performance, but on the other hand, this, now this performance was a performance of Macbeth that was done this spring at uh, Nathan Bishop School here in Providence, and um, there's a phenomenal teacher who uh, works a lot with, with theater stuff, and they were doing, not a straight-on performance of Macbeth, but as you can see, with the, uh, but this was a witch's scene, but it, it was a performance of Macbeth with their responses to it sort of woven in. Um, and it was, again, this is an example, this is more Macbeth, believe it or not. Um, and this is where the kids are doing s something, a Macbeth music, I don't think it was, I, it was a response to Macbeth. And then, this is another performance where a lot of things got put together. This is actually in Kurt's school in Mexico. Um, and you can see that the kids are, and the kids are learning English. These are all native Spanish speaking kids. And they're learning English and they're doing it through presenting their characters speaking in English. Now I'm going to show you very quickly, run through three kinds of approaches to the performance cycle very quickly, um, and then I'm going to sort of stop for questions and conversation because we haven't had enough of that. So this is um, um, Mary Beth Meehan here in the International Charter School in Pawtucket. And her work with kids is having them do original photography. Um, she's, a, she's a professional photographer, 
and what she's doing is introducing her kids to the idea of camera. She does it magnificently, and I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it, except to run you through a series of pictures to show you what it looks like. So here's Mary Beth introducing the cameras. Here's the, the, again, look at the focus of those. These are third graders. And then the kids actually get their, they have assignments to go home and photograph things. And then they come back and Mary Beth prints out uh, contact sheets. And then the kids make choices around the contact sheets. And this is their teacher. And then finally, at the end of an eight week um, unit, they do a, um, an exhibit for their family. And this is a, a, a call, and, and what they're studying with the camera is what's, what does it culture mean? What does it mean to be a part of culture? And so this is the kind of thing that they do. They do a great big wall of culture with, uh, the, this is by, there, it's a bilingual school, and this is a Portuguese and English group. Uh, and so they do a big wall of the contacts in categories. And then this is a picture one of them took. This is the quality of photographs that the kids actually turn out. And, and this is another one that I love. And then they always write a story that's connected to it. This is this child's photograph of his grandmother cutting, cutting him a piece of toast, obviously. And then they have an exhibit for their family. And again, look at their faces. So that's Mary Beth's work. Now here's, here's more, another approach. This is a group of teachers in Hartford, Connecticut, and this is making icons, and then here's what they do with the icons. Remember, oh, you remember um, overhead projectors? Nobody uses them anymore. So you can haul them out of the closet, and interesting things go, can go on. The, actually, the stuff that they turned out was totally gorgeous. And those of you who know Carol Walker's artwork, you know, she um, African American artist who does a lot of stuff in black and white. She did the sugar exhibit. Yes, yeah, that's right. And so she, and, um, she, she, I think maybe had an exhibit here, some long time ago. But anyway, she always does these kind of things that end up looking like this. Of course, very different format. So when the teachers rehearse this, they cut out their icons first and they put them up on a, the window. And then they put them on the overhead, and they actually were practicing finding a way to get the, the kids, what they were going to do with their kids is have the kids tell the story while the icons were being manipulated around to tell the story. So that's that. And then this is back to the Cordell on Bearing Witness. And this is what the Cordell looked like. And then this was a performance of the teachers uh, original uh, response to the question of what shall I bear witness to. Um, and, th and then this was the final performance of their own stories. So that's kind of what I wanted to show you. I guess I'll just go through it again. So it was building community, entering text, comprehending, creating, revising, performing, and then always reflection at the center of it. So we would, anytime we do this, we stop and have a lot of conversation. So that's kind of what we put together at Brown and are sort of sharing with teachers and kids all in different parts of the country. And it's very exciting to be doing the work. But it, as I say, it goes, it runs contrary to the testing environment that we're living in the middle of. And as far as, and from my perspective, if you, bringing art and science together has to run contrary to the testing environment that we're living in. So, and now a final thing about my own person uh, with Asperger's. Those of you who know anything about uh, autism and especially Asperger's, the Asperger syndrome, which is on the, on the spectrum, they become deeply interested in particular things, almost, um, how shall I say it? Um, obsessive. Um, so for, the, for kids like that, you have to ask the question, how do we want to educate them? And what can, we, what can we do to bring them along? And for me, a lot of the personal experience that I've been having around that question is per, trying to address. Now, this is, this is a very high-functioning young person. 
uh, and I understand that the spectrum is a spectrum, but answering the why question always seems to begin to penetrate and sort of bring that along. Um, so there's a lot more to say about both Asperger's and the arts and sciences and the, what I've presented to you, but I think I'll stop right now and pull up a chair and turn off and unplug. And um, here, I can just do it that way, can I? And pull up a chair and then hear you, hear you guys uh, what you have to say on the, on the topic. And some lights, I think, would be helpful. Yeah. Go ahead. This is really impressive, I have to say. Yeah. So let me get a chair from the sun there. Oh, right here. Good. All right. What, you know what? Why don't we do it this way? This is my teacherly, uh, where my teacher has. Take a minute and think of a question or a comment that you want to make, okay? Just let's have a few, couple minutes of silence. What? Oh, I see. So, so take a minute and ha come up with a question or a comment, something that you want to share, and let's be quiet for a few few minutes, and then and then we, and then I think people will really be ready to talk to each other. Okay. And you might want to re revisit this. Okay. I will say um, the one thing that I will say I, is that um, Kurt, who was my student. Um, and I wrote a book together that was published two years ago. It's called A Reason to Read, quote, colon, Linking Literacy and the Arts. And uh, it's, press, it's published by Harvard Ed Press. And Emma has a copy. Uh, and I do too, but not here. Um, so if you're interested, so it, it really addresses a lot of the things that may, may come up that you may not hear, get answers to. But it, it runs through the performance cycle and talks about why we think this is a good way to teach. Okay, so comments or questions? Yeah. So I'm part of the organization after our whole after our leadership uh, education program. Um, and it, it, I guess we unintentionally stumbled on this aspect. We work out at the Met, which is a charter high school uh, in Providence. And it's working on integrating environmental science into a very alternative way. Yeah, I know the Met pretty well. Yeah, yeah. And, and, it's, and it's a lot of fun because it's how do we present global warming in the context of, you know, simulating like a Hunger Games-like scenario and having people be creative and design certain things and act out. So, and it, 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 there's no PowerPoints. There's no lectures. Um, and that's part of the philosophy of the Met. Um, but one thing that I, I guess I have a question of, and because again, this has been a lot of fun, and, and the best way for these students to learn is to act out as skaters, to be in a group environment. But, I remember once we were cooking, you know, and we, we got everyone together and we started baking brownies. And we needed to multiply the recipe, the recipe by two. And it's like, it's multiplying fraction. And it was very difficult. It was very difficult because yeah. in this, in this yeah. alternative learning environment, which is a lot of fun, yeah. which is very engaging, right. doesn't, doesn't um, like maybe there are other ways to address mathematics, but like, there are certain subjects that don't lend itself right. as well. And, and the kids you have at the Met probably don't know how to double a recipe, right? right. Yeah, I'm not surprised. So, what, so is that a question? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but I guess it's a, it's a, it's a, a question on, uh, as to you know, how to embrace this mentality of teaching in a way that's productive you know, uh, you know how, how, how to bridge the standardized test and the creative environment. Right. What's your name? Oh, Jeremy. Jeremy. Okay. Do you have an answer? Um, it's not an answer on how we can bridge the two. Yeah. It's just how we can change standardized testing um, to be as standard but less multiple choice. Yeah. And basically, in the French baccalaureate system, I'm pretty sure that if you ask any French high school student, they'll be horrible at multiplying something by seven. I'm, I'm pretty sure I can really? say that confidently. Is that a comment on French people? <laughs> <laughs> really? But 
the the nice thing is that the standardized testing system is very open to open book exams, quote unquote. <laughs> so the baccalaureate yeah. encourages, in at least the maths and sciences, that we have a programmable calculator with as much of the textbook as we can have on it, programmed in it. And the idea is, in life we'll always be able to Google something or pick up a calculator and calculate an answer, but we won't always have somebody to tell us how to solve a problem. So that's one of the approaches they have to that. Yeah, go ahead. I just experienced that once in my physics, and I took a college physics course, and it was like open book or whatever, like if you want to learn the processes, but like if you're in a lab, you don't have not have access to a textbook or, or you know, instructions and stuff like that. So it's up to you, and it, and it worked out. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What's your name? Uh, my name is Isabella. Isabella. And a comment on that, and then a comment on the stuff you're showing us. So, comment on that is I remember my dad told me a story. It's like one of like the final tests and getting his like master's in engineering. Like one of the classes the professor said, you can bring whatever you want into the test as long as it's not the textbook. And my dad looks at him and he's thinking, I can program my computer to do all of this. So he did, and he brought in his computer. He was done with the entire test in five minutes. <laughs> because the teacher said he could do that. It's like, it's not, no, so I'm just programming my computer to do all the work for me. Hilarious story. Anyway, come on this. <laughs> because like in real life, in real life, it's like, that's why I get so annoyed by engineering homework. It's like, I can get it over math homework. I can get a computer. I can get both from Alpha or Mathematica to do this calculation for me. I can come think about better things. <laughs> but um, on like what you were doing, I noticed that a lot, a lot of it was about like integrating different senses, not just like different right. types of learning, like the yeah. arts versus sciences, but like you're reading Anne Frank and then you're like color coding your notes and then you're acting it out and then you're making like right. some sort of what you call them? icon Icons, to right. represent yeah. it for you. And just like how the integration of different senses kind of drives ideas home. And I know that the projects where I was allowed to do that in high school and middle school are the things that I remember best. Like I remember just a ton of Revolutionary War things mm -hmm. randomly because my teacher would do, she'd teach us a fact and then it wouldn't be like a covering sheet, it would be like go draw like some sort of interpretation mm -hmm. or like pretend you were there and do like a fake diary entry or something and stuff like that are the things I remember best. Because well, there's, of, there's that scale, I forget, where you remember 10% of what you read, 20% of what you hear, 30, and 80% of what you experience. Like 60% right. of what you teach, that's right. but 80 is like the highest percentage of what you yourself experience. And that's and think that the kinesthetic thing, like what you're, what you're doing with your body. And you can be doing any one of a number of things. You can be drawing, you know, you can, you can be dancing, you can be performing. But th that whole idea of body knowledge yeah. is, I mean, I probably, I'm preaching to the choir here, I'm that's sure. That's all right, you can do um, But anyway, <laughs> agree. You know, I, I want to come back to the multiplication tables, but not right now. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just I had a question, a couple questions. Um, one being, as you said, this doesn't, it's not you know linear, and they're all kind of they overlap and integrate and, and things like that. But I'm wondering about what's the timeline for for like each sort of piece. Yeah, it's a good question. And so and uh, so uh, the way I answer that question is that you could run through this cycle in a class or in a semester. Um, and so, for example, the Macbeth kids, um, they, it took a quarter for them to do uh, their response to Macbeth. But you could also do it in, a, in, a cl in one class. You can imagine, now, you wouldn't go all the way through, you know, but the idea might be that, by, that, that your performance, and we've done it, I've done a workshop in an hour, I don't like doing that, but I can do it. And, and the idea starts with community building and ends with a performance of under, what we call a performance of understanding. By the way, to get back to your point, Isabel, and, um, I don't know how many of you know the work of Howard Gardner and his intelligences, um, but um, there's a, a lot of research now that really shows 
exactly that argues for the fact that there are these modalities and that people learn more by invoking the particular modalities and by piling them one on top of another. What's your name? I'm Natalie. Uh, okay, very good. Natalie. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm Adam again, and I have a little question about building community in classrooms. Uh -huh. um, so whether we're a class of 30 students or 100 students, we do always have huge cur curriculums to get through and right. um, very little time right. and, and short classes. We right. don't have nice three hour chunks. We have 50 minutes in which right. we need to go through a whole chapter or else we'll be behind. And I realize that most teachers do not want to give up time right. from all of that to say, okay, let's sit in a circle and talk about our plans yeah. in life. It's true. Or things like that. How can we make that more accessible? So, uh, um, my, my response to that is that everything you learn really well, you learn in community. And by that I can mean you learn with your dad, you learn with you know, somebody that you care about, or that you find that community. I mean, gamers find communities of gamers, you know, those. So I think that community is really important. There are ways to do it that don't involve, you know, for example, if I said to you right now, turn to the per person next to you and talk for a couple of minutes about what you just saw and questions that you have, which some of your professors, I'm guessing, do, um, that's a way of building community, especially if you didn't, really didn't know the person you were sitting next to. So all I've been suggesting is that, um, th that the, as much as possible that the teaching and learning be more than one way, more than one way, and that the person on the receiving end be more than silent, um, and that the more sort of you can engage people in activities with other people, um, the richer the learning experience ends up being. So that, I mean, but again, you have to beg, you know, this, the thing that I love about doing about this, and I can say I love it because I didn't really invent it, I invented it with a bunch of other people, is that it's what we call both clear and flexible. So it's flexible, you know? So if you were in a lecture hall with 100 people, you know, I wouldn't have you dancing around. I wouldn't get you out of your feet. And if you were a bunch of, you know, I would, but what I might do is just what I said before. Now turn to the other person. Or, you know, um, pat, write a question and pass it to four, four, four persons down. You know, that kind of thing. So again, you're building community, but you're not necessarily, uh, you're doing it within the, if, within the framework of whatever the activity is that you want, want to be doing. Okay, let me call on somebody else. Yeah. I'm just curious, how do you decide on performance? How do you? Instead of one of the other art forms. How do you what? How, how did you decide on performance? Oh, rather than one of the other oh that's a great question. So, this is my teacher, teacher hat talking. So most often in everything that I do, I do what's called planning backwards. So when I start out to teach something, I usually know at the beginning what I want people to do at the end. Um, in the class that I now teach at Brown, um, on the first day, second day of class, I give them the final exam, which is their quote unquote performance. It, it's a very traditional <coughs> written performance, but they know from the beginning what it is. What, what's up there? Oh my goodness. Oh, it's a great day. Oh my heavens. Wow, that was a performance. I'm so sorry. I hope he's all right. You know, he's almost at the top there. Just go a little higher. Oh, I think that might be. It. Look. Um, how do I decide on the performance? So, um, I, always, I usually know at the end, at the beginning, what I want. Now, I certainly have given students an opportunity to figure out what the, their, they want their performance to be. But I usually know, again, based on how much time I have and how, what my resources are, how extensive it can be, 
And then from there, depending on who the kids are and, or the students are and how much we work together, I might say, okay, these are the parameters, now you decide precisely what you want to have happen. But for example, what Teresa Fox did with Macbeth there, that was fancy. So she had sets and she had costumes and she had, you know, and she, ha she had eight weeks and she knew from the beginning that it was going to be, oh, and all the other kids in this school were in the audience watching. So she knew, she knew that's what she was going to do. But in the meantime, the two kids wearing the play helmets who were reading Othello, they, that was what their performance was going to be, you know. So you kind of you figure it out depending on what the setting is. But I, I want you also to know that a performance doesn't have to be a piece of theater. It could be, certainly be a dance. It could be an experiment. It could be um, part of the, somebody in uh, St. Paul who went through this project then did a, almost like a, like a science fair, except it was a literary fair. And so his students had to pick some one of the books that they read during the semester and create a and create a display of that book and then the parents were all invited to come and tour around and then the students had to be a character in the book and sort of speak with that voice and so that was the performance more like a science fair than a you know than a performance so there are a million things you can do but I think a definition is that it has to be public for some size audience, big or small. Very often I will do, a class will prepare something and another class will prepare something and then they'll perform for each other, you know, and in a class period, I mean that kind of thing. Uh, but again, even something like that, you, you, you don't forget that, you, you take it away, you know. And it'd be fun for you to tell me, you know, when do you think you were most academical? Of course, again, I'm speaking to the choir. You're in this class for a reason, right? Um, but it would be fun for people to tell me when they think they were the most academically awake in school. Yeah. Can you uh, talk a little bit about your philosophy on, or your approach to some of the Asperger's and how, you know, in a class, how you might work with that student. Yeah, and you know, th that's interesting and it's tough because I don't know, you know, one of the things about, the one of the challenges of Asperger's is that, that they, um, they don't read social signals very well. And so setting up that kind of thing where people have to work with each other, you're, 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 it's a challenge. On the other hand, it's where you want them to be. And so, for example, one of the uh, one of the um, um, I'm trying to find the right word therapeutic approaches to kids with Asperger's is something called social stories, um, and they they get a lot of stories and they have to talk about them in groups and act them out and so forth. So again, you have to have a certain amount of training and preparation because if you get a class full of kids with Asperger's, you're going to find that they, a lot of them misread the social s signals and then you, you know, and that, and that represents a certain problem. There's a, apparently a terrific school in East Providence, for those of you who have an interest in it, called the Wolf School. Mm -hmm. Anybody know it? Yeah. Um, and it, I, it, the head of school is somebody who went through our program um, a long time ago. She was an elementary. Uh, doing an elementary MAT, so I don't really know her very well. But um, I've heard just wonderful things about it. So for those of you who have an interest in Asperger's, or in, I'm, I'm told that the, the work that they do with kids is top notch. And it, there's a lot of enormous amount of physical work. Another thing about kids with Asperger's is that they're very often physically clump. What's a better word than clumsy? Um, you know, not coordinated. Not, coordinate, not well coordinated. And so again, that kind of that kind of thing really seems to matter a lot. Is the discovery that someone in your family is has is, has is, is diagnosed with it? Yeah. Yeah. What has that done for you as someone who is an educator, and has that shifted your? Approach? Oh, a lot, hugely, just hugely. Um, many, many things. I mean, I guess the first thing. Um, is it answers a lot of questions because I, I did, again, I haven't read 
deeply. I've read Temple Grandin, which you're reading, um, and a, a bunch of other things, but I haven't read deeply into And Asperger's is so new that there's a huge amount of work being done on it. So I would say that I've read on the surface, um, and, but it answers a lot of questions for me. And it also makes me much more um, willing to try to walk in other people's shoes and to say, oh, well, I now think I kind of get where they're coming from. But as a teacher, um, I, I now, I, I taught public school for a pretty long time. So I look back at some of the kids and I thought, think to myself, is that what was going on? You know, is, so it wasn't misbehavior. You know, it was something else that you know that we put a label on. Um, so it opens my mind, I guess, uh, uh, and gets me to think very carefully about you know about how to be a, t a teacher. Uh, that's probably a very vague answer, but it's as good as I can give you right now. Yeah. This is sort of along these lines. But have you discovered anything that you think is particularly Like, do, I, do, you, do you think that you could make another kind of method like this that could be? Well, used? yeah, I think there are, I mean, the people who know other parts of the spectrum should jump in here because I don't. I know that there's something that they're doing with young kids called Applied Behavioral Analysis, ABA, and that they start very young and, um, and they do a whole lot of, um, do anybody know ABA better than I do? At all? Oh, okay. So I know there's a lot of well. Then you should a lot of direct teaching, a lot of very explicit and very concrete teaching, and I know it's also there's a lot of physicalization in it as well. Um, so, I mean, I I think the spectrum is a huge puzzle to me because I don't understand, I don't fully understand what what the whole, every aspect of what the spectrum looks like. And again, I'd love to hear you all talk about that. Um, you know, the, the kids who are, I mean, I, I, I think I understand Asperger's better than I understand the, I've certainly seen kids at the far end of the spectrum. I remember one little boy that I, um, what's the thing that they call when they flap their hands? Stimming. Stimming, Stimming right. Um, and, I, and the whole idea of needing physical, a different kind of physical support and um, input. So, so I don't know, it opens my mind to learning a lot about these things. Um, that's the best I can say right now. That's also a revelatory discussion in our, our group, because we tend to look at the spectrum as over there. Uh -huh. and in order to be on the spectrum, you have to have multiple symptoms. Right. But if you isolate any one of the symptoms, they go across the they go across the spectrum from neurotypical to extreme. So you right. take something like sensor, some kind of sensory thing. Like you can't stand to have be touched. Well, right. there are people on. If you just isolated that one characteristic, yeah. you'll find people along that spectrum. Right. And so it, I think it would be interesting for us to, and I think nobody else is really doing this, to break down the symptoms and then look at everybody on where, where they fit on the spectrum. And right. It's true that you're going to wind up on the spectrum if you have multiple ones, yeah. but each one of those yeah. is within, a, within a, from normal, what you want to call it, to the extreme. Yeah. And then you could have people like a Temple Grandin who's articulate about it, who could talk about that particular right. thing that would then give us an insight into right. the ones that are less articulate about. So I think that's the kind of interesting way to look I, at it. That's fascinating. Yeah, and that's that really yeah. But it's just like looking at it. So to it. take something like your response to touch or being touched or being held or... And there are people like that. I mean, some people, neurotypical people that don't like to be that's right. hugged or touched, yeah. but they're still considered yeah. That's right. Yeah, we'll that. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's really good. I totally agree that not letting me touch or hug. Yeah, so that's <laughs> good. <laughs> well, so that, that's another thing that, to answer your question, it's, I've had to ask myself a lot of those things, you know, 
where do I fit on the spectrum? And it, that's fascinating. You know? Well, I also find myself just totally like Asperger's, Asperger's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like my you right. know, it, now that it's gotten all of this, because I think, to Julie's point, we all are on that, yeah, what, to what extent. Um, but I think, you know, I, I'm sure people here, I think would agree, it's just because there's so much, so much still unknown. That's right. You're saying it's not you, you don't know much. I think none of us know much. I mean, we're trying, and, and there are a lot of people out there working on it. We've just been reading all kinds of studies, some better than others. And uh, I think there's just a long way to go. Well, because it's a, a new sort of... A but new having sort. the open mind, like, like you were saying, is being willing to now go, oh, so this behavior may be something more than just mm -hmm. poor behavior, yeah. or, you know, like willfulness, whatever. Yeah. And I think that that's a huge piece of it in terms of educators. Um, that's right. And so very often, now at the same time I know that kids, it's struck, a lot of structure works in some ways, but let me see how to say this right. So a lot of structure, but with the understanding that sometimes that structure is something that doesn't come easy that at all to kid, to those kids. And so you have to really work on uh, how, to, how to make the structure palatable for, for the kids and, and also make them self-aware, at least the kids of the Asperger's, and more self-aware of what, they, what their own needs are. You know, and so forth. Uh, it's you know, it's just a fascinating topic, and I I should say about arts lit, by the way, that one of the uses that we're finding for it very effectively is with second language learners. For what must seem very obvious when you use another modality, when you ask them to draw something, that's a, you know, then they have something to language about. What um, so very we we're working in um, Hartford. Or at least last year we did, and I think we will again with second language learners, and seeing how we can introduce this set of ideas mm -hmm. in such a way that it supports language learners. Comments, questions, yeah. Um, I'm trying to find the name of the course, but there's a course at Brown in the Hispanic Studies department about cooking. And oh. it's basically you spend every class making food and talking about the food. Cultura gastronomica de España, it's called. Well, that makes perfect sense in the sense that language, language is embedded in activity. I haven't talked about gastronomic, gastronomic or whatever, but that's very good. That's high level, you're saying. Yeah. 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 The entire course is fine. Yeah. 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 Like, like it's like we're super good. Now see, I could see doing it and be, couldn't you do beginning Spanish that way? I mean, that. I, I, exactly. Yeah. Why, why say the fun? Yeah. 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 And I think that's what pushes people away from taking base level language courses because they're just super boring. Oh, they're terrible. Oh, they're just terrible. But you have to know the, like, the grammar. You have but there are ways of also making it. Yeah. There's so much talk about immersion. immersion yeah. And when you really learn a language, like when you, yeah. just, you just go visit a country yeah. and you pick it up that's so right. much faster than breaking that in a book in a classroom. That's like the best part of Dartmouth's curriculum. Is there, is there how to do their languages? It's full immersion. It's just a year of just speaking that language in class, and like, and the professor has to be fluent from that country that you're learning the language from. And it's like, it's crazy. When our friends go there, like within a year, you're completely fluent in that language. Well, you know, I th I'm glad you raised that because I almost forgot. There's a professor here right now, Patricia Sobral, who teaches in Portuguese and Brazilian studies, and she uses the performance cycle to teach. Portuguese. So in her class, her course is called Performing Portuguese. Um, oh, and um, she took our course, she sat in on our course when we were teaching it a long time ago, and she liked the idea and she's adapted it for, for, uh, for, for learning Portuguese. And people say it's wonderful. So, so there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody who hasn't spoken yet, who has. See, 
I am very, I, I'm willing to wait a long time. I have no problem with that. Yeah. Do you have any students that are really shy and don't want to put Sure, and of then, course. Is there like another option? Of course. Like the written pieces? So, again, you have to be a good teacher. Uh, one of the stories we tell in the book is um, about uh, a teacher in Central Falls, actually, who worked with behavioral, I, I, they call it behavioral disturb. That's not the right term. That's a terrible term. I don't know what it's called, but they're kids with behavioral issues. And so the beginning, the very first class, he, he said we're going to do all this great performing stuff. <laughs> they were working in the auditorium. And the first thing that the most challenging of the kids did was jump up on the stage and wrap himself up in the curtain and just wrap himself up like he was a burrito. And, uh, and he stayed in the curtain and um, said, I'm not doing that. You know what word he used at the end. And, um, and so it was an interesting thing because the teacher observed him very carefully and was a very, very skilled teacher. And by the end of the thing, the, that child was, was the director of the piece. You know, so again, there are people who certainly don't aren't don't take this work right away, and you have to be thoughtful and. Ju but just like me, if you, I mean, if you ask me to really do a, uh, well, even dancing is, um, is not something I naturally do. I mean, I will do it, but I'm very aware that I'm not tremendously graceful. Uh, so I've got I've over I've I've gotten past that, but years ago. I didn't, I wasn't like that, so anyway, yes, of course. And the, the thing about it is that you can provide alternatives or be patient. Uh, you, you know, all those things are, are possible. Um, be encouraging, uh, you know, and so forth. So that's the answer to, to, that's my answer to that. Any other, yeah? Um, as, as, as someone who does performance and, and have a lot of different directors. One of my favorite things about like working with a new director is, is is seeing a new way of like approaching feedback, and that seems to be a huge part of your um, of your cycle. And, and and definitely like some directors are better with people than others. And I was wondering if you have like a format that's best for feedback, or if you found certain methods work best, or, or what kind of yeah. kind of vision you have for that feedback piece of, of, of it. Um. What's the name of the dance woman? Um, Liz Lerman. What? Liz Lerman? Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I know she's famous for having developed it. Right. And feedback. so Liz Lerman has a whole method of, of, as, of getting feedback from people. And we sort of borrowed some of that. So, um, so one, one thing that I'll do, and adapted it. So one, a question that I like to ask right away is, what did you notice? Um, and it's a big open-ended question, but what did you notice about what we, what we did? What did you notice about what you do? Uh, and just get the very concrete noticing out there. Mm -hmm. And then another one that we use is what questions do you have? Um, so, I mean, again, the reflection depends on where we are in the cycle, but the idea is that at every point along the way, what you really want is for kids to become self-aware, not self-conscious, but self-aware. And so this is what I can contribute, this is what I can do, this is what I would like to have happen, and so forth. Um, so there are, Liz Lerman has a f set of question, four questions, and I think they start with things like, what did you notice? You can find them on If the you internet. go to the danceexchange.org yeah, toolbox, it. I mean, yeah. it's something I, really, I look at, I haven't looked at it in a few years now, but I used to look at it a lot. It's a really great resource if you're conducting groups and want to do creative interplay. Yeah. So just go to the toolbox for yeah. Dance Exchange. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Someone who has not spoken up at all but who has something, to, a question or a comment. Be bold, yes. I guess I just want to know a little bit about your um, experience. Like, um, you've worked with children and you've worked with um, adults and everything. And I guess, like, what are the what are the diff differences that you've seen uh -huh. among everyone? Like, similarities or such that stood out? Teachers are the hardest. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. Um, you know, there's dignity involved. And, um, 
Well, yeah, I mean, it's hard to generalize the difference between kids and adults, but, um, but very often kids are a, are a lot less self-conscious and, you know, will sort of, get, and unless they've been bruised or damaged or terrified or very shy, I mean, all of those things, kids will play. Um, and um, adults are cautious, you know. Again, it depends on the individual, but very often that is the case. So um, my friend Kurt, what the, I mean, he's a genius at a bunch of things, but one of them is getting people within 10 minutes or so to do, I don't know if you remember the picture of the sort of older teacher who was doing something sort of like that movement thing that was all the way, I showed you all the way back in entering text. Um, but it, I, I've never seen anybody better than taking a group of people who, who are cautious and maybe don't know each other very well and within 10 minutes getting them to do a lot of interactive stuff. So, and, and the way he does it is very small, safe little steps. You know, I mean, he doesn't ask people to get out and stand on their head first thing around. He'll, he'll say, let's just walk in a circle and just pretend that you're inside yourself. You know, start with that kind of thing. Um, but sure, adults are, are much more reserved, I think, by and large, than kids are. But a lot of kids are cautious about school. You know, they, a lot of kids know that school is a place where they have to be really protect themselves. So we talk a lot about safe space. Um, Jan, my friend, my teacher friend in St. Paul, had a big banner in her, had a big banner in her room that said safe space, and she, her whole thing is around constructing safe space. Um, I mean, it also depends on what the kid's experience has been. You know, the, some kids have only experienced love and, and encouragement, and other kids have, people have encouraged, you know, just been criticized a lot. And so very often you could read that in their body language. But to get beyond, to be open up a little bit, is I, I just think it's a great thing for everybody, you know, and to try on different modalities and to see that you can do things that you didn't know you could do. So there was a question right there, and I forget, again, I'm forgetting your name, so I'm bad at that now. I'm, I'm Jeremy, actually, I think Jeremy. you actually addressed it. Oh, okay. Yeah. You don't have to stay till the end. Yeah, That's I mean, the end. Show, but they in fact, they would embrace the idea of not staying till yeah. the end. I know that well enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, a couple of last comments or questions. Let's, yeah. Grievances about the sciences at Brown oh, okay. uh, is the title of my, my grievance. Oh. And basically, it's. <laughs> <is>, um, <laughs> Tell us about that. At, at I, think, have, I think he probably has, right? At Brown we have some very nice science classes. Yes. And then comes lab day. Yeah. And usually in labs, we have a to-do sheet or yeah. something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're told step by step what we're yeah. supposed to do. That's right. And, and then how supposed you turn out? Come yeah. out saying, yes. okay, so what should I use this for? Yeah. Or what did this teach what me? Am what am I learning? Why did I do this? But Things like that. And add, did I get correct data so that I will completely fail this lab report? <laughs> is, there, is there any science class, lab class that works with the English? Oh, <laughs> or a, a teacher, te you know, someone who is a pedagogical? Well, yeah, there, are, there, are, there certainly are. I mean, again, uh, some of the faculty that I, I know, uh, Wait, people in bio, bio, that's right, I know Peter Haywood. And I know, oh, what was his name? He used to send people out to observe animals. Oh, uh, can you see the, uh, the, uh, computers in the bird Yeah, I just, yeah. But, but anyway, of course, and that's what a lot of high school science classes are, too, exactly the way you described it. And, um, but that's pretty useless. <laughs> well, no, 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 what? So the, uh, the purpose of, like, or, or go lab, Mm -hmm. Right. That's to have us learn techniques, and like so that when we go into an organic, like that, that that's a practical yeah. skill. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. yeah. All these chemicals and all the. But but you know, it's, there's got to be 
I actually have, I mean, you, you know about Utra, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so there have to be other, I mean, U Utra does, enlists you in doing real research, right? Or with people. So it's not entirely always that way. Yeah. Um, and I also know that there are gigantic classes, you know, uh, I mean, great big classes and um, what was the one that I always heard was a genetics is a real challenge of a class. <laughs> my, my it's coming nice to the world. Euphemism. I don't know. I think E&M kind of tops everything. Uh, yeah. Just saying. What's E&M? Oh, it's just the advantages of them. At least the engineering version. So we're in the same lab. We have a hundred percent error on our data. Like, <laughs> and they're like, like so what is for the experiment? Yeah, like, what do you think you're doing? Like, well, pretty much we don't know. I mean, it's really dog. But at least you guys have something to <laughs> study from before exam. Genetics. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, but, you know, I mean, I said, uh, see, this, I'm going to come back. This is how, actually, how I'm going to close, which is sort of astonishing. I'm kind of a believer in the multiplication tables. Um, <laughs> so, um, I do feel like, yes, it is the case that you can access almost anything all the time. And especially I find from my aging brain that it's a great gift that I always have my phone out for, for that. What was the name of that author? Yeah. Or what was that, you know? Yeah. Um, but the fact of the matter is that there are a few things spelling. I, I, I kind of like when people spell right. And I know there's spell check. <laughs> But um, but there are a few basic things that I that I think are kind of useful, and that probably is coming from my generation, in which that you know th that was the way you did if you wanted to know how multiplication to multiply something, you didn't have the internet to do it. Um, or telling time with the so I do feel like there are some things you said, yeah. but that's a very personal, that's a very personal response. But I think in a way it's like oh, reading okay. a book as opposed to reading it. I mean, I'm, I agree with you, and I'm back to, you know, this generation, but, you know, I like having the book. I think knowing the times tables is, I mean, I think there's foundational, right. actually two different things, but foundational, Stuff that's good to know. Yeah. And, and, and I know this, and I'm not facilitating something you know, yeah. not to replace. replace. Or, or like, like Google Maps. I mean, and I'm guilty of this. I'll look at the map, but not get a whole sense of the real, you know, my the proprioceptive, my place within all of this. Right. You know, it's like, follow this, follow this. But let me look at the, that big picture and sure. understand east, west, north, and south, because I can just Google it and have somebody tell me, turn right now, you know, turn left, you know. I mean, like, and I would say, like, I completely agree with you that I foundation I believe that there are foundational things that we need to learn. The question I think they're getting to is how do we teach us that's things right. and that's still right. incorporate yeah, these methods? Because right. the fact is, you that's can right. teach the multiplication tables using alternative methods, like yeah. through performance and through interactive art and cool. media. I mean, music. Music is a great thing with math. Like, yeah. music is geometry and algebra. Like, literally, a piano is geometry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. And I love things like, again, I think you can use manipulatives, Legos or, you know, uh, those kinds of things. So, so, uh, but I do feel like that's very personal for all of us. Like, what, what are the foundational things? And that would be fun for you to find out, you know. And then the question is, are there ways to teach those that don't take endless amounts of time but are really helpful? Um, and I think there probably are. Yeah. Do you want, you want to have the last word? Oh, well, I don't know if this is the He's last. I don't know if this is the last word. Um, but then you mentioned spelling. I just thought it was interesting. It's like a case study of where trying to do something very creative and very wonderful yeah. put me at not at this bed, but I can't spell a single thing. Yeah. This might have a long lineage of dyslexia yeah. in my family. Yeah. But yeah. also, <laughs> in, in second grade, they taught us imaginary spelling so that we could convey our ideas and write right. more fluidly. It's than called invented spelling. And boy, can, do people get on either side of that one, I'll tell yeah. you. What's you know, magic? Like yeah. sounding out a word and spelling. But did you, are you sounding out real words or are you making up words? No, or no, you, it's, you sound them out. And so, for example, I, I shouldn't imagine. answer yeah. for you, but, I, but as a teacher, I know this. So if I said to you, to a kindergarten kid, write the word book. They would write BK. Um, and, and you would go, 
Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and that's just it. But now I'm 21. And <laughs> <laughs> so it's not hard anymore. Not that, not that I can't spell or like, think about a certain word, but like, just like those third grade words. You pine for just days. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it just, um, I, I, I was striving for a doctor at the free clinic and just yeah, correct my spelling over my shoulder. You, you know, couldn't understand like, his handwriting, so what would it matter? Right. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just, it's just a, a yeah. thing that. And you know, know what I noticed I now? I just upgraded my uh, to an iOS 8, I guess it is. And now, when I it's so write, it, it proposes words to me. It's not just, it doesn't just propose letters, but it suggests words. Like, you know, I say, good, and then it puts up their morning. <laughs> right? That's annoying. Yeah. I don't want it's good. Yeah, I can turn it off. off. It's I awesome. can turn it off. I can't have right? a second. I don't have a yeah. phone on my phone. But anyway, I, I don't know the answer to this. Uh, and I have to say, in Alahad, the last word, that one of the things I'm totally fascinated about is, you know, whether or not reading of whole books is, is, is something that's just going to stay with the most privileged elite class, the kids who, sorry, get into Brown, or is that something that we're, you know, people will continue to do, and whether it's online or off, offline, I'm not so sure. Can I have another word? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You commented on it was a big part of your the community building community was something that our small group talked about and it said that you know this class built community pretty early on because of the nature of the class and and I think that's a strength of this class too we kind of we get to know each other pretty quick I mean we don't know each other but we are, we're comfortable no, with each other yeah. uh, really quickly and I just wonder if if there was a way of doing that in all classes even if you only take a few minutes. I know that there are all these classes that have so much to have to get done in each lesson, but it doesn't take a lot of time to build community, really. I think, I think you can certainly do a lot. I mean, think about this. In a regular school classroom, uh, and also in a regular ground classroom, chairs are in rows, mm -hmm. and, and you're looking at somebody's back, yeah. and, and, you're, and the person who's facing you is the authority figure. I mean, even just the design of the room makes a big difference. But that's extraordinarily purposeful. It, it is purpose. It is purposeful. Purpose. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Like you're the expert. Yeah. Teach. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we yeah. always hear. I mean, that's the way it always <laughs> was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then again, though, like I, I, I don't think I know Janet Ellis. Sure, I know her. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful person. I had her for a geology class, and she chooses this room for intro geology that's set up. In a way, so that yeah, there is a professor first, but it everything is like kind of in this. Like Macmillan one fifty. One fifty exactly. <laughs> where it's very different than a regular lecture hall, where at least like you are sitting at tables oh, next to people. Oh, the, yeah. the weird Star yeah. Trek bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, it's a good building. 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 Well, so Jan Tullis is one that I know the only reason that, I mean, she's always worked with in doing work with teacher preparation people. So obviously, that's something that she thinks about a lot. I mean, there are people, teachers at Brown, who, you know, in unusual places who do think that about these things and then others who don't. And what, one of the things that we find with the MATs is that after we've had our way with them, they go off into their brown classes and they come back all full of complaints and criticisms, you know. So we have to be really, really careful about that, but uh, like about the labs and so forth. But the fact of the matter is that you can be thoughtful about it and just being able to think about, and this is the last word, combining arts and science. I mean, just the juxtaposition of those two issues requires that you think about it because you can't. You can't just put people in rows and, and lecture at them. It's by its very nature. So I thank you very much. It was fun to be here. Thank you.